Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out uh, for uh, this event to start your day. I'm John Ayanian. I'm the director of IHPI. It's my pleasure to welcome you and to welcome our honored guest, Julie Rovner, uh, for the fifth annual IHPI Director's Lecture. Uh, we're launching a new format this year as opposed to a podium presentation by our visiting speaker. Uh, we've opted to go with a fireside chat, though uh, we don't have the fire going yet on the screen. So. <laughs> Uh, hopefully you'll stay warm. But it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome Julie Rovner, who's the Robin Toner Distinguished Fellow and Chief Washington Correspondent at Kaiser Health News, where she also hosts the weekly podcast, What the Health? Julie joined <laughs> Kaiser Health News after 16 years as health policy correspondent at National Public Radio, where she helped lead the network's coverage of the passage and launch of the Affordable Care Act. She's an expert on health policy and the author of the book, Healthcare Politics and Policy, A to Z. She's been awarded the National Press Foundation's Everett McKinley Dirksen Award for Distinguished Reporting of Congress. Prior to working at NPR, Julie covered health policy for the National Journal's Congressional Daily and for Congressional Quarterly. Uh, most importantly, Julie's a proud alum of the University of Michigan. Go Blue. <laughs> and former man uh, managing editor of the Michigan Daily. Uh, where she still serves as an advisor to the, to the uh, student team leading the Michigan Daily. So please join me in welcoming Julie back to her alma mater. Uh, so our format this morning is I'll start out with a, a series of questions for Julie to, uh, to launch our discussion. Uh, and then about halfway through our hour-long session, we'll open it up for questions and comments from you in the audience. We'll have two microphones uh, uh, that IHPI staff will be helping to bring to you. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Uh, if you're following this uh, session on Twitter or want to tweet about it, it's at hashtag IHPI19. So Julie, to start, uh, a fairly broad question, but how would you characterize the current tone of health reform in DC? Polarized. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I started covering uh, health policy so long ago that it was not just bipartisan, it was nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't a big partisan issue because it wasn't a big national issue at the time. They were talking about the deficit and the Cold War, the ending of the Cold War. This was the late 1980s. Um, Education was a pretty big issue at the time, but healthcare was really not. Congress mostly, when it came to healthcare, um, tinkered around with Medicare. I came on just after they put in the DRG system and just before they redid the, the physician payment. And it was very um, technocratic. Um, and there were, you know, there were some serious experts in Congress and they did their job. And Republicans, they generally worked with Republicans. Most of the things that came out were consensus. And then in 1991, everything changed when Harris Wofford ran for the Senate and uh, basically ran on a, um, a platform saying that health care should be a right, which nobody had ever done before. Mm -hmm. Shockingly beat the sitting Attorney General of the United States, Richard Thornburg, who'd been the two-time um, governor of the state, and suddenly health care was a huge political issue, and we haven't looked back since. And, you know, Bill Clinton came in, sort of cemented the idea of health care as a partisan issue. And I think sort of with every succeeding decade, it's gotten more and more partisan until we get to this point where there's very little that they seem to be able to do. Hmm. So if we think now, you know, we have a Congress where the Democrats control the House, the Republicans control the Senate, and then President Trump obviously has an important role to play in health policy. Do you see any prospects on the horizon for any bipartisan changes to health care over the next year and a half before we go back to it, another presidential election? Well, I should say that, you know, that for all the polarization at the, on the health reform side, there has been some bipartisan action kind of below that. They did macro big big important bill um, sort of reconfiguring the way they did the, the physician payment and, and, and renewed CHIP in 2015. And that was a, not just bipartisan, it was unanimously bipartisan, which was amazing because it was an enormous uh, piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. um, but while they were busy fighting about whether or not to repeal or replace you know, the Affordable Care Act, they were doing macro. We're seeing them try to do that this year on drug prices and on surprise medical bills. Um, but as, as we have discussed on the podcast, and I have written, um, 
in this case, bipartisanship might not be enough because they're, they're going to have to make somebody in industry unhappy, particularly mm -hmm. on surprise bills. It seems to be kind of a zero-sum game. They're either going to make the payers angry or they're going to make the providers <laughs> angry. Um, you know, they, everybody agrees that we should get patients out of the middle and that you shouldn't send you know, out-of-network surprise bills to people who have no way of knowing that they were out-of-network. But who's going to pay for that is another issue. I ran into someone after I did my story. I was sad because he gave me, uh, Ovik Roy, um, this wonderful quote that said, yeah, they agree on the surprise part. They don't agree on the billing part. Uh, OK. <laughs> so uh, that's actually an issue that some of our colleagues here at IHPI are studying. We have a program called Policy Sprints, where we try to bring evidence to bear more rapidly than traditionally uh, academic groups have on important issues that are in the state or federal uh, uh, limelight. Um, in the case of surprise billing, do you have a sense of how that may play out? Is there any opportunity for compromise there? And, and maybe also for those in the group who may not be fully familiar with the term surprise billing, Sort of how would you explain it or how have you heard some of your uh, colleagues explain it? Yeah, and that's it? part of it is how you define it. I mean, surprise bills are generally whenever a patient gets a bill they're not expecting. But when in the context of talking about legislation, they're mostly talking about um, emergency bills where it's an emergency. And so you end up, so you go out of network because it's an emergency that you think are supposed to be covered. And more commonly, when you go to an in-network facility and get a bill from an out-of-network provider, um, usually either the ER doctor or an anesthesiologist or a pathologist, um, someone who works in the hospital but is not in network. Th those, are, those are really what Congress is looking at. They're not looking at the sort of general spread of, oh my god, you thought this bill was going to be $100 and it's 8000 which mm -hmm. is also a surprise bill. But that's, that's, not, that's a different issue. That's mm -hmm. more of a transparency issue than the surprise bill issue. But w there really is this sort of setting up of sides of, you know, the, basically everybody wants the other. They say, let's not do this to the patient, but they each wants the other side to pay for it. Okay. And are there any state models for solving this problem that you're aware of, or does it need to be solved at the federal level? Um, there are a bunch of state models. In fact, a lot of people are using, uh, there's a New York law that uses what's called baseball arbitration because it's what Major League Baseball uses where the, the provider and the payer go in and they give their, instead of sort of negotiating, they give their last best offer. And the theory is that that will be realistic, that they won't ask for, for the sun and the moon because the arbitrator basically picks one. The arbitrator doesn't pick a middle. The arbor, arbitrator figures out which one is most fair and picks that one. So there's an incentive to, to pick a realistic number. But payers don't like arbitration because they feel like it's going to drive up the um, the the average cost. So basically, you're going to end up higher. They would rather have a benchmark, some percentage of Medicare or mm -hmm. some other benchmark, you know, what, what, whatever the average is. And the providers are terrified of that because they feel like then they'll get their, the payers will kick people out of network and push down the benchmark. So both sides are afraid of malfeasance on the side of the other. Okay. But they do have to do it. It does have to be federal and not state. This was the problem with the Patients' Bill of Rights and the Affordable Care Act. Because of ERISA, um, more than half people with employer insurance um, have insurance that is not regulated by the state, that can't be regulated by the state. It can only be regulated federally. So if they're going to fix this, they're going to need Congress to do it. Now, another issue you raised was prescription drug costs, whether there could be any bipartisan agreement <laughs> there. Uh, what, what's the current status? And I know even the, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Trump administration have put out or their own proposals for regulatory changes that might help to control prescription drug prices. Where do you think we stand both in Congress and with some of the HHS proposals? Well, there's a lot of push in Congress to boost generics, um, you know, make it, make it harder for brand name companies to prevent generics from, uh, from coming to market. Um, tra price transparency, getting behind the black box of the, the PBM wholesaler, retailer, prescriber issue, I think that's going to be a lot harder. Uh, you know, but even some of these generic bills, you know, there's the, the idea of Congress passing a bill to ban brand name companies from paying off generics not to come to market. That thing's been kicking around since the late 1990s. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we haven't seen these things before and they haven't passed and, oh, it's bipartisan. It's like, yeah, it's been bipartisan. But, um, you know, we'll, at some point we'll see 
at some point, you know, the tobacco, when my early years covering healthcare, the tobacco industry, if the tobacco industry didn't want it, it didn't happen um, until it did. And I think we're going to see the same thing with the drug industry. Mm -hmm. At some point, the drug industry doesn't want it. And at some point, Congress is going to say, really, our constituents are, are clamoring for this more than you are giving us money. We'll, we'll see where that tipping point <laughs> comes. I don't think we're quite there yet. So you brought up tobacco, and that sort of leads to another area where I was actually quite surprised to see some potential bipartisan agreement. Mitch McConnell and Tim Kaine coming out with a proposal for raising the age for purchasing tobacco products to 21. It's actually an issue we've been following here in Michigan. We have a team uh, at our School of Public Health supported by IHPI that's been looking at the implications of making that change here in the state of Michigan, both for the young adults affected as well as the, the, the business community uh, th that provides tobacco products and the, the enforcement, the law enforcement community that would have to enforce any new law. So what, what do you think about an example like that? Have you followed that proposal I have, from McConnell and we also and talked about it on the podcast. Um, I put this in the category of what I call um, uh, companies suing for peace, that they would rather sort of be there and raise the, the they want to raise the tobacco age from 18 to 21, in theory, because then high school seniors would no longer be able to buy e-cigarettes, which is the issue at the moment, for their younger classmates. That's sort of the justification of, of raising it from 18 to 21. But there's a, and this is a bill that's sponsored by, you know, a Senate Majority Leader McConnell, obviously from a tobacco state, Kentucky, and Tim Kaine, the vice presidential candidate in 2016 from tobacco, com tobacco company state, Virginia, um, because there's a competing bill that would not only raise the, the age to 21, but it would ban flavors, including menthol, um, it would ban all flavors, uh, um, and I believe that the flavors are not just in e-cigarettes, but in, in tobacco, too. And I think they're not so excited about that, so they think they'd rather have their bill than the uh, other bill. Okay. So I want to shift gears. Uh, you know, we're entering a presidential campaign, certainly on the Democratic side. Uh, it seems like every day we have a, someone new declaring their candidacy for president. Uh, I think we're at an even two dozen. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> So we were joking at dinner last night, will there be more candidates on the stage or people in the audience when <laughs> we have the presidential debates? Uh, so how would you characterize sort of the spectrum of uh, views about health reform now within the Democratic Party as it may affect the upcoming campaign? You know, we've got sort of one uh, group of the Democratic Party supporting strengthening of the Affordable Care Act, uh, getting the marketplaces to work more effectively expanding Medicaid in the states that haven't yet expanded it. Uh, we've got some arguing for a public option, which was originally on the table nine years ago when the Affordable Care Act was being debated, but then didn't make it into the bill. Uh, and then we've got Medicare for All as sort of the, the most dramatic change in our health care system. Um, sort of how would you characterize sort of the camps within the Democratic Party and, and how this may play out both in Congress, where there's a lot of pressure on Nancy Pelosi potentially to bring a Medicare for All bill to a vote or some other uh, health reform proposal, as well as sort of the, the upcoming presidential campaign. I think people tend to get confused. I think that the effort to do, you know, what they call ACA 2.0 or shore up the Affordable Care Act, do undo some of the things that the Trump administration does. I think that's a, a legislative strategy by Nancy Pelosi to protect, you know, we, we hear, we see here and see all of these new progressive Democrats in the House. But the reason the House has a majority is because, that has a Democratic majority is because Democrats want a lot of the swing seats that are, you know, either districts that voted for Trump or traditionally Republican districts. Um, and Pelosi, in order to stay speaker, those people are the ones who are gonna have to keep their seats. I mean, somebody, uh, you know, what was uh, the, the line about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is that, um, I, I forget, it was like, you know, a toaster could win in that district, which was not intended to, it really wasn't intended to, to be an attack at her. It was pointing out that that is such a Democratic district that if you run anybody with a D after their name, they're going to win. Um, not true in a lot of these other in a lot of these swing districts. Um, and so what Pelosi is trying to do is find sort of the least common denominator that moves forward the agenda, but also, you know, they, all the Democrats ran on health care. They want to have something to show on health care. Then there's a separate parallel debate going on about how to expand coverage. So there's this perception that Pelosi is only for fixing the Affordable Care Act. She's not for any kind of coverage expansion. I don't think that's the case. It's, like, she says it's not the case. I mean, mm -hmm. but I've heard her. Um, 
uh, then you have sort of the continuum, and we're seeing this in the presidential campaign, of how to expand coverage. If you're going to move beyond the Affordable Care Act, what do you do? And it sort of started out with just the Medicare for all. And we had, at the beginning of the campaign, when there were only seven or eight people running, they were pretty much all co-sponsors, at least the ones in the Senate, um, of Bernie Sanders' Medicare for all bill. Well, since then, we've started seeing concerted attacks on Medicare for all by industry. They've gotten together. Um, the insurance industry, but I would say that, that even more than the insurance industry, the hospital industry, because they're terrified of getting paid Medicare rates. Um, that just completely freaks them out. So um, we're also seeing on the Democratic side pathways to some sort of major transition. So now you get the Medicare for more, and the Medicare at 50, and the Medicare for America, and the sort of different incarnations of how to expand coverage without basically getting rid of the entire insurance industry. And what's interesting is that on the campaign trail, a lot of these Democrats who had been Medicare for all Democrats are starting to endorse some of these interim steps. And talking about it in the context of, I'm for both, I would like someday to be at Medicare for all, but maybe in order to get there. Um, you know, I think, I think we're actually far enough along in this debate, for the first time this debate's been going on for quite a while, to talk about, well, what would a transition look like? Because a transition would almost be harder than, than, mm -hmm. you know, than the, the system itself. How do you get there from here? And I think some of these are sort of strategies of getting there for here. And I think that's where we are in the, in the debate right now, which I think is probably a healthy place for us to be as a society, we should really be talking about this. I mean, the Republicans are thrilled that the Democrats are talking about Medicare for all because they want to you know, come in and beat up on it. But at least there's a dialogue going on about, well, what would we like our health system to look like? Mm -hmm. And if we go back to the first point about strengthening the Affordable Care Act, is there any prospect with the Republican Senate and Democratic House for a bill to, to make it to the president's desk that would address some of the shortcomings or stresses within the Affordable Care Act? Um, probably not, and the reason is abortion, which of course is what almost felled the Affordable Care Act in the first place. There was a bipartisan bill last year, was it last year or the year before? Um, I think it was last year, mm -hmm. that they almost got through to, you know, to, to put back the cost sharing reductions and to make it easier for states to do reinsurance, and I mean really pretty benign stuff. And it got hung up because the House, the then Republican House, decided that they wanted to put a permanent Hyde Amendment into it. And the Democrats said, yeah, not happening. Um, because that's been sort of the, the threshold abortion fight in Congress for a while. The Hyde Amendment is on uh, the Labor, Health, and Human Services Education Appropriation Bill. In theory, uh, well, in, in actuality, it has to be renewed every year. In theory, they could take it out, although they don't have the votes to do it. But the one thing that the Democrats will not stand for is putting it into permanent law. They at least want to maintain the idea that they can make it go away. And for those in the audience, I think many have heard the term Hyde Amendment, but may not know what's actually in the Hyde Amendment. Could, could you the explain Hyde Amendment, it? which was which my favorite piece of trivia was not actually originally written by Henry Hyde. Um, it was the, the final language was uh, was drafted in a in a conference committee. Um, uh, Bans uh, federal funding of abortion primarily in Medicaid, but it's been expanded to a lot of other programs. So basically, there's no federal funding of abortion in, at, currently in cases of rape, incest, um, or life of the mother, the only exceptions. Um, there was not always a rape and incest exception in the Hyde Amendment, which a lot of people don't know, but I spent like the first three years on Capitol Hill covering the fight about that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it does, it, you know, it, it lives in the annual spending bill, so it has to be renewed every year. It gets changed from time to time. There was a, there was a year where they had to sort of renegotiate um, because there was so much Medicaid managed care, they had to make sure that it extended to managed care plans, not just to, um, to states and, and providers. So, so though it's, been, it's definitely been tinkered with over the years, but you know, abortion it obviously is a hot issue of the moment, but it's been a recurring hot issue for a long time, anytime you're talking about government funding of health care. Mm -hmm. So much of your health policy reporting has been on reproductive health issues. So in the past several weeks, we've had several states pass major changes to their abortion laws. Uh, how do you see that playing out? It, it, much of the discussion is that uh, the laws are being passed so that cases can be brought to the Supreme Court. Uh, Roe versus Wade can be revisited uh, by the, the new court, the current court. 
how do you see that playing out as a health policy issue and as it moves through, you know, from the state legislatures into the federal court system? Well, one of the things that obviously we've seen is that it's sucking up a lot of the oxygen right now that, that would otherwise be used to talk about other health issues. We're, we're back to sort of abortion being a very front burner issue. Um, you know, what's prompted this is the, the perception that there are now five votes on the Supreme Court to strike down Roe v. Wade. Uh, and so what you're seeing are redder states passing abortion bans and other kinds of restrictions in an effort to be, you know, the state that, part of it is an effort to be the state that gets to the Supreme Court, that gets it overturned, but also part of it is to be ready in case Roe v. Wade is overturned. You, conversely, you're seeing a lot of bluer states pass laws um, basically uh, eliminating pre-Roe abortion bans. What, what Roe basically did is it didn't say abortion is legal. What Roe said is states, you can't make it illegal. So all the states that had abortion bans, and there were a lot of them, um, those bans were suddenly null and void, but a lot of them are still on the books. So if Roe ever went away, those bans, many of them would just pop back into force. So that's why we saw some of these issues um, in states like Virginia and Massachusetts and New York trying to strike old laws from the book and having trouble talking about them in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that it, it caused, in fact, the Republicans loved talking about the, you know, the, you know, women having abortions, you know, right before birth, um, which is not a thing. Uh, but, but it was a great talking point for the Republicans. And of course, now we've, we're seeing all these bans that don't even have rape and incest exceptions. You know, if you look at public opinion on abortion, it's all, it, it is, has been pretty consistent and pretty mixed. Um, the public is generally for uh, abortion rights, but with restrictions. And so the, the question is, what kinds of restrictions, when should abortion be allowed? I mean, there's very few people at the, it should never be allowed and it should always be allowed. Um, almost everybody is in that sort of murky middle part. Um, and it's generally, the, the closer to the beginning of pregnancy, the more support there is in the public and the closer to the end of pregnancy, the less support there is. So at this point, the Democrats are thrilled because we're talking about these, you know, abortions at, at or banning abortions at six weeks. That's, that's sort of more uh, abortion rights uh, ground, they have more of the public behind them than talking about, you know, very late abortions when mm -hmm. the, 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 the anti-abortion people have more of the public behind them. And what's the chance that any of these uh, laws will make it to the Supreme Court in a decision in the next year and a half before the presidential election? Or is this likely to play out over a longer time period? I don't know. I thought what the court did this week was really interesting. They'd had this Indiana law that was signed into law by Mike Pence when he was governor um, in front of them since January. The, the court has a conference every week when they're in session and they decide what cases they're going to take. So these are the cases that we know are at the conference. The conference is, not, is private, so we never know exactly what's said at the conference, but we'll, we usually find out on Monday morning, you know, here are the cases that we've granted cert to, because most cases at the Supreme Court, they don't have to take. Some they do, um, but usually abortion cases aren't among them. Uh, and then, and it's been before, the, and usually something will be on the conference docket for two or three weeks. This Indiana um, law had been on the docket since January. It had come up like 15 times. I mean, it was just, Nobody had any idea what was going on, and the law has a number of parts. One of them is banning abortions for uh, race or sex selection or because of uh, diagnosed uh, disability. Um, another part, and this has been passed by a number of states, uh, said that um, uh, fetal tissue from abortions and miscarriages had to be either cremated or buried or not treated as medical waste. Um, and the what the court ended up doing was deciding the case without taking it. Um, there were, they wrote a per curiam opinion, which means it's unsigned, um, that basically split the difference and said, yeah, this ban, not happening. The cremation and, and fetal burial can go into effect. Um, and we're not going to say whether or not it was an undue burden, which is the current standard for the Supreme Court. They, a state can't put on restrictions that amount to an undue burden on the right to get an abortion. But in both cases, both the, the decision said, but if another state comes back and wants to argue this again, we're still open. We're not really deciding it. We're just sort of putting the Indiana law. And uh, you know, it was basically an invitation to say, this is not the last word on either one of these issues. So it basically gave something to each side. I read it as Chief Justice Roberts wanting desperately not to have a big abortion decision drop in the middle of the 2020 campaign. Okay. Um, that's sort of a long way of getting that kind of smacked of, 
we're gonna we're only gonna deal with things we have to deal with, and if we're gonna do this, we're not gonna try and blow up the country in June of 2020. Whether they're gonna succeed, I don't know. You only need four votes to take up a case um, in these conferences, so the chief justice really can't have his say. I mean, if he, four other justices, he, right? Yeah, he would be yeah. the he would he's presumably the fifth um, who who opposes abortion, yeah. um, and not not entirely clear. You know, we know that. Under the in the Affordable Care Act case, that he was worried about what would happen to the credibility of the court if they struck down a law that big. Mm -hmm. There is a presumption that if this current Affordable Care Act case gets to the Supreme Court, he was he's likely to do the same thing. We know less about what he might do on abortion, but we got a pretty good hint this week. Yeah. So actually, in, uh, in a moment, we'll open up to questions for the audience. But you you led into my my next question, which is that federal court case that was decided by a judge in Texas when the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act was challenged at least for the third major time. Uh, and th that federal judge in Texas declared the law uh, unconstitutional because the tax penalty uh, has been reduced to zero for people who don't have coverage under the individual mandate. Uh, you know, many legal scholars across the political spectrum think this case has very little merit and yet we still have more than a dozen Republican attorney generals who are advocating for it, and it's expected to work its way up to the Supreme Court. Can you say a little bit more about what's at stake in that case? And uh, the entire Affordable Care Act is at stake in this case. Uh, the appeals court is having its hearing uh, in New Orleans the week of July 4th, I think it's the 9th. Um, but what, that, that week after, there, there will be oral arguments in this. So it's, it's moved up to the next level, which is the, the um, Federal Court of Appeals. Um, this case basically said that Congress in 2017, when they reduced the penalty to zero, they didn't get rid of the individual mandate itself, but they reduced the penalty to zero. And because Chief Justice Roberts had written the opinion saving the ACA in 2012, saying not that it did violate interstate or that they couldn't use interstate commerce. To, um, to have the mandate, but it was, a, it was an okay use of the taxing power. So what these Republican attorneys general are arguing is if there's no tax, there's no law, um, which is kind of a stretch. I mean, you could, uh, originally the Trump Justice Department argued that, yeah, we don't think that affects the entire law. Maybe the things that are most closely tied to that tax, remember it was intended to, help, to encourage healthier people to sign up, so that maybe the community rating part would have to go, and maybe the, you know, requiring insurers to, to take people with pre-existing conditions, the, you know, the really popular things, those might have to go. The, um, the administration has subsequently reversed even that position and said, yeah, we agree with the judge in Texas. And that's because, mm -hmm. you know, the Republicans still have a lot, a lot of the base, if you look at the polls, still wants to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. They're still angry at the Republican Congress for not being able to do that. So the Trump administration said, yeah, let's do that. But in practicality, you know, the law is so enormous. Among other things, it would deauthorize the Indian Health Service because that was in the Affordable mm -hmm. Care Act. Um, it would take away the, the pathway that it created for generic biologic medications. I mean, would, you, would those become unapproved? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there, there's so many questions if the law was simply overturned. It's hard to actually contemplate what it would mean for the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's hard, it, you can't really erase something that's now almost 10 years old and has touched almost every piece of the healthcare system. So there is a presumption that if it gets to the Supreme Court, and it might not, the, I mean, the appeals court might say, yeah, no, and then they might not appeal it any mm -hmm. further. Um, but if it, if it did get to the Supreme Court, the expectation is that Roberts would be consistent. And mm -hmm. of course, that's assuming that by the time it gets there, still Roberts and four liberals. Yeah. So, I mean, there may come a point at which Roberts <laughs> is not the swing vote, but for the moment he is. Okay, thank you. Now I want to open it up for questions uh, from members of our audience. Uh, and we have one here, and uh, Sarah will bring you the mic. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Sonia Rangaraja, and I'm uh, one of the attendings in the Division of Geriatrics. And um, I had a question about the HHS conscience rule. I'm, um, I know that's been um, a pretty controversial, and uh, the whole idea of uh, healthcare providers being able to deny care based on their religious beliefs. So uh, what do you feel has been the um, reaction to it within DC and where do you see that playing out? 
Well, there were lawsuits filed against it this week. We were waiting to see. Um, it's interesting, I covered, there was a conscience rule that came out at the very end of the George W. Bush administration that the Obama administration, I thought, would just repeal, and they actually didn't. They ended up rewriting it. So this is a rewrite of the Obama rewrite of the George W. Bush um, uh, HHS <laughs> conscience rule. But it goes much further than even the, the original one from 2008 did. Um, and it is, you know, there, there is this perception, I mean, that it's not just, that it starts, at, actually the one in 2008 really did start out in being about abortion because it had to do with ACOG, um, uh, requiring that um, OBGYNs who didn't want to provide a reproductive health service had to refer, and there was a big fight about that. Um, and that was what, where the rule came from. Um, but there is this concern that it that will extend not just to reproductive health, but to, um, to gay and lesbian people and trans people and anybody else. You know, there, there are stories about doctors who don't want to prescribe birth control pills to unmarried women that basically, you know, at what point does this end? Um, I don't know what the courts are gonna, gonna say about this. It did not get litigated last time um, because it was so close to the change in administration that there was kind of no point in suing. So, I mean, I'll, I'll watch along with you to, to see what happens. And I, you know, I guess it depends on where they sue and what judge they get. Um, but yeah, I think it got, I mean, it did get a fair bit of attention. Part of it is that there's so much happening right now that there's just this enormous, you know, e even just in healthcare, I'm not talking about the, the greater things that Washington is consumed with right now, but even in healthcare, there's so much happening now. Things, things that would be enormous stories are getting forgotten about. Okay, other questions? <coughs> and we appreciate everyone introducing yourselves as a way to get to know each other. Please, please. Uh, in light of the complexity that this audience certainly understands, how do you grade the work of yourself and your colleagues in explaining these issues and <coughs> various contradictions and hypocrisies, etc.? I think actually we're doing a better job than we used to. I remember, you know, I covered the, the Clinton Health Reform Plan in 1993 and there were all these national political reporters covering it. and. It was abysmal, it really was. Um, there are people who were just sort of dropped into the healthcare beat, not knowing the difference between Medicare and Medicaid, and suddenly asked to do all of this very complicated analysis of you know, important policy decisions. And I thought the debate was really subpar, to say the least. Um, it was a little better with the Affordable Care Act, maybe not a ton. Um, again, big, complicated, easy to demagogue. Um, easier for reporters without a depth in the, uh, in the subject to do the horse race and the politics than it was to do the substance. And I think it's so important. I'm actually reading Uwe Reinhardt's last book um, right now. And you know, most of it is, I feel like it's, not, it's stuff I knew because Uwe taught me over the years so, you know, so well that I've internalized most of this. But there are discussions that as a society, we just don't have. And I think some of that is because we need to be led by journalists, people who can take the expert work and translate it for a lay public. And I really do think that, that we are getting better, partly because there are a lot of health journalists now who you know, do have a depth of knowledge here and there are resources to get more knowledge. IHPI, thank you very much. Um, and so it's better, I think you know, time will tell when we, we're about to launch into yet another round of, of you know, major health reform debate and I'm, I'm hoping that we'll do a better job still than we did during the ACA. But yeah, I think the, the Clinton plan was definitely the low watermark. <laughs> so Julie, I actually have a follow-up to Paul's question, which is for our university audience here, faculty, staff, students, uh, the work of the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation and our whole community is often focused on bringing better evidence to bear for health policy decisions in the public and private sectors. Uh, how do you and your colleagues as health policy journalists sort of look at work coming out of our university and others, 
Uh, how can we make it more relevant? How can we make it more known? Even if it could be relevant, but if it's not known uh, by you or your colleagues, it, it may not influence the, the reporting and the, the, the commentaries that you're providing. So what advice do you have? I wish I could tell you it wasn't random, but it's pretty random. I mean, it mm -hmm. depends what, what, as a reporter, it depends what you're doing at the moment, um, what your editors are, it's not, it's not always what you want to do, but what your editors want to do, um, what somebody is screaming about, uh, you know, it, it's hard to, sometimes it's hard to break through. I often get stuff, it's like, oh my God, this is such a cool story, and I have a file, and I put it in the file, and then I never see it again. Mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, I, I, I wish I could give better advice on sort of how to do this, but you know, be persistent, call, you know, uh, don't, don't bug people. This is, it's, it's a fine line between, you know, I, I look at all my email and there's a lot of it. Um, I, I don't necessarily respond, I couldn't respond to all of it, but I do mm -hmm. look at everything. And, you know, and I see something that's like, that's interesting, or that's something that we should talk about on the podcast, or that's something that is it that I've been thinking about and might want to put in a story. I mean, I do, I don't necessarily respond, but I'll put it somewhere. Um, so that it is, you know, obviously, to some extent, a lot of news organizations are led by what, you know, the, the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal write, but that's, I think that's less so than it used to be. Mm -hmm. I think, um, particularly in, in health policy, journalists sort of, you know, go by their inbox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you think about the, the various ways that information comes to you and your colleagues from press releases, from tweets, from, uh, you know, table of contents from major journals, uh, you know, coming out on a weekly basis. Sort of, do any of those stand out or, or, or what, uh, what gets something to the top of your list where you might actually be pitching an idea to your editor because you saw something coming out? In my case, it's just something that I think is really interesting and new. Um, sometimes I might think it's something that I can recognize as news, but that others might not. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of, because I have, you know, such a, such a long history in this, I can see it's like, wow, that's really different from what we've seen before. Um, mm -hmm. And are there any examples of that you can think I'm of in to recent think of, months? Of, no, I actually, I ended up doing the surprise billing story just because I was getting all of these emails from all of the stakeholders that I could see were completely disagreeing. Everybody else saying, this is really bipartisan, it's going to happen. I'm like, um, I'm not judging from my inbox, it's not. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. That was literally where that story came from. It wasn't any one thing, it was seeing the theme yeah. of, of each of those. It's like, oh, this is not good. These people are like completely, these people want this and these people want this and they each don't want what the other one wants, which mm -hmm. is, I'm not saying they're not gonna get some kind of deal, but I'm saying it's not going to be as easy as it yeah. looks. Okay. Um, so yeah, it is. It really is hard to say, and it's, you know, if I'm in the middle of working on something and something completely different comes across and I think, oh, I wish I had time to do that. I mean, there's some, a lot of it really is just good timing. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, there's something that's so big that you just have to drop everything yeah. and do it. But more often, it's something that's like, oh, this is kind of cool. This would make a good story. Mm -hmm. Other questions from our audience? Hi, thank you for sharing your time with us this morning. My name is Wendy Lombard. Staff at IHPI. And uh, one of the questions that I have related to abortion is that beyond the nature of the procedure itself, there's a lot of um, outrage regarding some of the, what I would see as like individual per, uh, variations of provided practices related to um, dismemberment of the fetus in a partial birth abortion or leaving the fetus to die without providing any type of health care. And I was curious to know, um, are there um, legislation in states or discussions about um, the broader um, legal aspects of abortion that address these more uh, provider practice variations? There are lots, and there, I mean, they're, you know, they're, the, the Supreme Court did uphold um, a ban on partial birth abortion, which was actually not a very commonly used technique, although there was a peer-reviewed um, study in one of the OBGYN journals that said in, in some cases that it was actually the safest uh, method to use. I actually went up to Cornell and interviewed a doctor in the high-risk pregnancy uh, unit there who was who was not thrilled about this. Now, of course, um, a lot of states are trying to outlaw D&E abortion, and that which is the most common uh, procedure used in the second trimester. That has not been tested in the courts yet, but there are a lot of, and, and I think, and, and it is already illegal. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the idea that, that doctors are delivering fetuses and, and, 
and you know and watching them die or not provide that's actually that is considered murder if it is a viable fetus it's already illegal um, and there's already a federal law that addressed exactly that that passed in 2002. Um, the Republicans in Congress are now using it because they want to sort of politically beat up on, on Democrats who support abortion rights. And I mean, I think that's the other thing that's really happened to the abortion debate is it's become much more partisan. It didn't used to be partisan. It used to be ideological. There were people who supported abortion rights and people who opposed them, but they weren't necessarily all Democrats or Republicans. That's less so right now. There's very few Republicans uh, that are left who support abortion rights and very few Democrats who oppose abortion rights, although we did see a Democratic governor this week in Louisiana sign an abortion ban. Um, Louisiana, you know, a very conservative state, very long history of, of opposing abortion among Democrats um, in addition to Republicans. So it's, some of this is sort of the, the partisan part, but some of it is we're waiting to see what gets to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm uh, Jonathan Cohn from HuffPost sometimes colleague of Julie's. Um, you having uh, covered, this is the third go around of Democrats talking about doing a big health care reform. And I was curious your impression of the preparation and process of thinking through their reforms, how this generation compares to the one in 2007 that was talking about this compared to 1993 when the Clinton administ people and Democrats were talking about that. Weirdly enough, I think there was actually more preparation both in 1993 and definitely in 2007 than there is now because in the one thing they learned, in 1993 there had been a, a bunch of sort of smaller efforts. Um, there was a tax credit that ended up getting repealed because it didn't work. I think they basically came to the conclusion that you're going to have to do this all in one piece. You can't do it in little tiny increments. That was, that was the decision that was made and that was not made by Bill Clinton. That was made by the Democrats who were running Congress and running the health care committees at the time was that you actually did need something more holistic. It wasn't that they wanted it to be bigger because they knew that would be disruptive, but they knew that it would have unintended consequences and they were going to have to address them. So there was a lot of thinking about that in 1991 and 1992, um, getting ready for 1993. In 2000, for the Affordable Care Act, there was enormous groundwork laid before Barack Obama even thought about running for president in Congress. Um, you know, Ted Kennedy, without whom there would be no Affordable Care Act, convened all of the stakeholders and they met for months. Um, you know, that was a case I talked about suing for peace. That was a case where the entire healthcare industry wanted to sue for peace. Nothing was working for anyone and they were ready to do something about it. So it was this sort of magic moment where everybody was willing to sit down and say, I'll give up this in order to get that. So they had the drug industry and the hospitals and the doctors and the insurers and the business community. I mean, everybody basically and labor on all on one page. And so when, and there was this enormous white paper that Max Bach has put out. I think it was the week after the Obama was elected. I mean, the groundwork was set, and I think that's mainly, it, it's, as you saw or have studied, it almost fell apart an awful lot of times, even with all the groundwork laid. I don't think we're seeing that right now. I think there's a lot of talk about, you know, we're just going to rip up the whole system and start over, which pretty much no country has ever done. Um, it's always been incremental. I think we're just starting, as I said, to see people start to talk about the kinds of things that we would have to, decisions we would have to make as a society, the transitions that would be needed, that, you know, people were sort of disappointed in this Congressional Budget Office report that came out a couple of weeks ago about, you know, things to think about with single payer because it didn't actually score a single payer bill, but it was a really useful document for starting to think about, here's what you would have to do, and it had this very little help, very helpful little section, it like, look, here's what other countries do, maybe we should look at some of them, because they're not all single payer Medicare for all, in fact, most of them are not single payer Medicare for all, they have various iterations of how they do it. Um, that's the kind of thing that I think needs to happen, and I think it's just starting to. Phyllis, we have a microphone coming. Um, I'm from Australia Slaughter. Um, I work for HPI. And I think that there's been a lot of pressure on the budgets and on funding. And I just wonder what your take is on the funding for health services research um, in the future. Good question. That is a good question. <laughs> you know, obviously, this administration is not 
necessarily a fan of health services research. They're not necessarily a fan of evidence. Which is, <laughs> which is a problem. It's not just the administration. I mean, this is, this is a serious societal problem, is that science is now considered to be up for, you know, partisan debate. It's like, things, this, is, this is why we have a measles uh, epidemic. Um, there are that, this, is, this is a really serious concern, but I think, uh, I don't want to say that this should be partisan. In general, Democrats have, a, have more of a desire to fund health services in general, plus health services research. Um, you know, things like ARC were created in a bipartisan way. In fact, they were really started by Republicans um, during, I think, Bush won, the, the first Bush administration. So this shouldn't be and has not always been partisan. Some of it is the sort of effort to just, the, the, the federal, feel like the federal government is doing too much anyway and they should do less. So there's always sort of that concern and it's easy to, take off things that are not delivering actual services in healthcare, um, which is not to say the health services research isn't important, but yeah, it will, I think, continue to be, you know, as, as the federal deficit once again gets larger, there will be efforts to see where to cut, and that appears to be, you know, an easy place to cut. As you've noticed, all the efforts to cut it have so far not come to anything, and now the Democrats are uh, in charge in the House, so it's unlikely that there would be as much of a concerted effort as there might have been for the last two years, but it's always gonna be a threat. And w one specific issue in funding for health services research is the reauthorization of PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which was launched nearly a decade ago, uh, along with the Affordable Care Act. In the Care Affordable Act. Care Act. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But now, but it, it, the authorization, as I understand it, runs through 2019. Um, it started with bipart part, bipartisan support. Does it still have bipartisan support? And, and what's the prospect that PCORI, you know, is with us for the next five to ten years as through this Congress's deliberations? Well, I think part of that is the problem of the doubting of evidence, that people are thinking, you know, that there is a perception that science itself is biased, and so you can't believe evidence. Um, and I think that's going to come into play. I haven't, um, it hasn't sort of risen to the level of, uh, of, of having to happen yet. Um, it's possible that it could be slipped through, but it's also possible that somebody will say, why are we doing this? Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I remember when Congress first started talking about comparative effectiveness, it was Republicans who were talking about it. It was, mm -hmm. it was, it was Republican to start it, it was bipartisan, um, but it has become, you know, again, with the, the sort of uh, attacks on science in, in general and evidence, I, I think it's going to be, I don't know whether I'll say it'll be a heavy lift, but it'll definitely be a lift okay. to get Corey reauthorized. We have time for a few more questions. Linda. Hi, I'm Linda Lahren. I am one of the hospital directors at the uh, University of Michigan Health System. I have a different kind of, kind of question for you. You know, in my whole life, in terms of politics, I don't think I've ever been in a place where it has affected me so personally, where I'm so angry and so frustrated all the time. And so somebody like you who is working in the middle of it, seeing multiple sides, my question is, where are, where's the optimism and the, is there light anywhere? And what do you do for resiliency? You know, how do you, how do you overcome this? We just wait it out? Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I have a horse and a dog. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, the barn is like my no politics zone. Um, and always has been, and it's nice. That, that, is, that is what I do for resiliency. I just like, go look at dog pictures. Go home, <laughs> go home, work the dog. You know, I got a show coming up. That, that's sort of, um, because, you know, I grew up in Washington. I've lived, other than my four years here, I've lived in Washington my entire life. Um, and it does, you sort of, I'm old enough now that I feel like I've seen it come and go, although this is really the, the, the level of insaneness that I have never experienced. And kind of every day I come home and say, I'm just glad my parents aren't here to see this. Um, it would have upset them greatly. But it is, you know, there's this sort of, you kind of cling to the, I was a young teenager during Watergate and when it really did feel like the wheels were coming off. Um, and sort of, you know, we lived through that. And um, I was actually writing the first draft of my book during the Clinton impeachment. I just basically went home and worked 18 hours a day and paid zero attention to the news. Um, it, 
you just you you hope and assume that the nation is strong enough to persevere. So is coming back to Ann Arbor part of your rejuvenation? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's lovely in the spring. Yes. Even though uh, Julie had great challenges getting through the thunderstorms yeah. in DC uh, yesterday, so we're very happy that you made it uh, to join us today. Uh, other questions from the audience? Yes, one in the back. Hi, my name is Heather McCollin. I work for a small company that does patient education, specifically about pharmaceutical research and development. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, I was super excited to hear you say that you think the journalists have a better background now to report more accurately on healthcare topics. Um, I was wondering how much of an obligation you feel, especially in some of the more uh, politicized science, I guess I'll call it, um, to make sure you're educating your readers, not just presenting the facts of the current story. Um, I, there is an obligation. I mean, I feel like, you know, what I bring, I have, colleagues who do like amazing work with data, which is not what I do, or amazing investigative work. Um, I feel like I bring context, and I like to bring context to, to stories. That's something that's really important, you know, even to, as much to say, this isn't the first time this is happening, or this has happened before, or when this happened before, this is what happened with it. You know, I, I, I tend to write stories sort of putting a bigger frame around things, but I think it is really important not to just parrot things and not to just do the he said, she said, and you have no idea who's right. You know, some people say vaccines cause autism and some people say they don't. Um, there, there's a lot, there's still too much of that. I can't take responsibility for everyone else in journalism, but I think in general, um, at least speaking for health policy reporters, I'm not a medical reporter, um, but for health policy reporters, I think as a group, we're doing a better job. Um, Rich Hearth here in the middle. Uh, I'm Rich Hearth from Health Management Policy. Uh, one aspect of the Green New Deal, to really kind of shift gears here a bit, is that in the same sort of plan that links climate policy and health policy, is that something that you see gaining traction more broadly, that kind of linkage? Yes. Uh, you know, along with social determinants of health, which are obviously more, in, in many ways, you know, more predictive of how someone is going to do and help, you know, health-wise than the medical care they do or don't receive. Um, the, the environment's effects on health, I think, are just starting to be kind of, we don't have anybody covering environmental health at the moment, but I think we will in the near future. I think there are a lot more people who are, and I think that those two um, areas are definitely um, coming closer together. Um, I have no idea what that's going to do for either one of them, but I think it's definitely sort of good that we are trying to appreciate the health impacts of changing climate. And there are a lot of them. Here in the front. Hello, my name is Gurpreet Drana. I'm the health, um, Global Health um, Librarian at the Health Sciences Library. And um, when working with um, colleagues internationally and um, having experiences um, working in the global health sphere, um, their uh, health, um, the administration of, of health in the United States um, by, I don't know, for lack of a better word, is, is often found to be perplexing on an international stage. <laughs> and, and, um, That's a good word. <laughs> and just as a personal note, um, I, I was born and raised in Canada. And so I'm just wondering, um, is, is, the, um, is DC, are they seriously looking, seriously looking at other health systems um, around the world? to see if there's something they can take from that. I don't think you can take DC as sort of a, right. uh, I think some people are. That's why I was glad to see the Congressional Budget Office did it. That's not usual in a Congressional Budget Office report to say, look, here's how other countries do it. <laughs> <laughs> not that they couldn't find out. I'm still, about every three months, I resurface a piece that Atul Gawande wrote in 2009. I think it's called Getting There From Here. Um, and basically what I learned from that piece that I had not known prior to that was that every single country that redid its health system, basically, I mean, well, they all built on what they had, but they all built on what they had 
there was something that sparked it. In Britain, it was the end of World War II. In Germany, it was the, the fear of socialism. I mean, there were, you know, every, even, even the ones that had happened before, um, everybody sort of had a reason for doing what they did, and they all built on what they had. And it's just, and I thought it was, it's such a useful, it's like, you know, with, with very few exceptions, nobody has ever just ripped up their health system and started over, and particularly not when it's a fifth of the economy. Um, so I think at some point, as we get a little more seriously into the, how do we get there from here? Um, I think people will start to do that. I think, you know, I went in 2008, um, when, I, when I was still at NPR, we actually fanned out across Western Europe to, um, to look at sort of, and I think the, the name of the series is something like how they do it. Uh, I went to Switzerland because I thought that that's what we were going to end up with. I was right, because um, they have an individual mandate, although we don't anymore. But it was interesting to go to Switzerland. I'm dying to go back, because when I went in 2008, they'd only passed their, they'd only really sort of put this into full effect in 1996. They had a national referendum. So it was still a pretty new system. I'd like to know what it's, you know, how it's doing 10 years later. But it was really, I, I thought, I learned an enormous amount from doing that. Um, and I think that, Others could too. <laughs> so Julie, we're nearing the end of the hour. Uh, on your weekly podcast, What the Health, uh, you often end the discussion with a question to your guests. You call it your extra credit question. What's an issue or story that's maybe flying under the radar that you think people should be paying more attention to? And I'll expand it from this week to this month or sort of recent uh, events. But um, if I were to pose that question to you, what do you think is a, a health policy issue or a news story that we should be paying more attention to that's not sort of the top of the headlines right now but could become more important over time? Well, I think the conscience rule is one of the things that, that really has the potential to, to very seriously change um, how uh, health services are delivered in this country. I think that that's been sort of underestimated. Um, and I think that, you know, it came, it got a fair bit of publicity, but I think they put it out on a Friday. Um, and, you know, again, sort of news overtook it. I think that that's one of the things. Um, I think the other one is probably what's going on with Medicaid. Although again, sometimes that surfaces and we're all talking about Medicaid, but um, the, the, the sort of the fight over, the partisan fight over Medicaid, you know, over what, what it, you know, becomes the broader societal question, what is our obligation to provide health care for people who can't afford to pay for it themselves? And when you say Medicaid, you're referring specifically to Medicaid expansion or broader issues broader about Medicaid? Broader issues about Medicaid, um, work requirements, um, uh, expansion, how Medicaid pays for drugs. There's a lot of Medicaid issues that are out there. Partial expansion, whether it should be okay for a state to, to only go up to, to expand but only up to 100% of poverty. There's a concern that if they allow that, that some states will then go, go down. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, you may get some people covered who wouldn't otherwise be, but you also may end up uh, with people losing coverage. So okay. there's a lot of Medicaid issues out there. Well, I want to give you a chance for the last word. You've heard the, the, the concerns and questions of our audience today. Um, what, what thoughts would you like to leave us with uh, from your visit here? Back um, to your alma mater. Yeah. <laughs> Please keep doing what you're doing. It really is. I mean, we really do look at it. I know it can be frustrating. Sometimes you feel like you're sort of shouting into a void, but it is. Journalists at least still believe in evidence, and it's nice to have. So Great. thank you. Well, thank you, Julie.